Hey everybody, it's your life science slash biology teacher, Mr. Poser. Today we're going to be continuing our first unit on the nature of science by discussing the nature of hypotheses, theories, and laws. Three very important concepts that are often very confused by somebody who doesn't study science, aka the lay person. You might hear the lay person say something like this on your screen. Well, that's just a theory. Or, I don't believe it is if it's just a theory. Or, if it's true, then why isn't it a law? Now, the common misconception is that theories are not proven by science and laws are proven by science and thus things that we regard as theories are therefore not as credible or as believable or as well supported as say a scientific law. If we're talking about the law of gravity versus the theory of evolution, uh, one seems to be set in stone while the other seems to be somebody's idea that has not been proven um, and that could not be more wrong. And that's what we're going to talk about in this video. We're going to dispel the notion that a law is better than a theory or that a theory has some kind of hypothetical, see what I, see what I just did there, hypothetical purpose to it. Um, so let's just differentiate between hypotheses, theories, and laws because they're three very important parts of science, but they're often very confused among uh, people that do not study science. So here's something that I really want to get off the bat right away is that a hypothesis is not the same as a theory and a theory is not the same as the law. They have three separate purposes and distinct purposes in science and each has their own role to play and they're not all the same thing. Okay? This Venn diagram does a pretty good job summarizing the similarities and differences between theory and law but uh, we're going to come back to that in a second. All right. Uh, let's talk about hypotheses first. A hypothesis, hypothetical, see what I did there, a supposition or a proposed explanation based on the, or made on the basis of limited evidence as a starting point for further investigation. Okay, so hypothesis, oddly enough, translates from Greek into foundation. The hypothesis is the foundation of an, an experiment or a study. Excuse me, I'm tripping over myself. So a experiment or a scientific study really can't begin without writing a hypothesis, a proposed explanation or perhaps a prediction based, made on the basis of limited evidence. So in one way or another, I'm, I go back and forth on whether or not this is an okay sub, uh, summary of what a hypothesis is, but it can be kind of like an educated guess. Um, a hypothesis can be supported or refuted based on evidence drawn from data. Okay, so this hypothesis can be accepted or rejected at the end of a study, and it's a really important part of the whole scientific method. A hypothesis has no predetermined outcome. Okay? It's not really a hypothesis if you know what's going to happen at the end of the experiment. Um, it can be supported or refuted through experimentation and observation. And two important points about hypotheses is that they are falsifiable, meaning that they can be shown to uh, not to be supported by evidence and not correct, and they can be testable. Okay? A hypothesis needs to be able to be testable by other people. Otherwise, then it doesn't really help science much at all if other people cannot test your hypothesis as well. And if you can't test your hypothesis, then it's not really a starting point for further investigation if you can't test it. Okay, So it has to be falsifiable and it has to be testable. All right, so let's start dispelling the notion between a hypothesis and a theory being the same thing here. Uh, so here's a question. If you predict that the Milwaukee Bucks will win the NBA championship again, next season, are you hypothesizing or are you theorizing? Okay, If you say, I think the Milwaukee Bucks are going to win the NBA Finals again next season, is that a hypothesis or a theory? Well, that's going to be a hypothesis. I'm making a prediction based on limited evidence and prior knowledge. I'm not making a theory. You might hear somebody that doesn't really understand science say that, oh, my theory is that the Milwaukee Bucks are going to win the NBA Finals. Um, and that's not a theory at all when it comes to science. That's more of a hypothesis. It is testable and it's falsifiable and it's based on limited evidence and prior knowledge. Okay, let's talk about a simpler experiment, even simpler than the one that uh, we did with the tomato plants in the last video. Okay, Let, let's chat about this. All right, so here's a stick figure and it's got a ball. Okay, hypothesize what will happen if you let go of the ball. Well, it's uh, going to fall to the floor, right? We know that that's going to happen. Okay, uh, all right, let's try a ball with a different mass. So this is a smaller ball. It's got a lo lower mass. What's going to happen? It's going to fall too. Okay, so if we drop both of the balls at the same time, we have a bigger ball in the what was it, left hand and a smaller ball in the right hand, what's going to happen when we drop them? Well, they'll fall at the same velocity. They'll fall at the exact same time. They're going to hit the floor at the exact same time, but the ball with more mass is going to hit the 
lower with a greater force on account of the fact that it has more mass. Okay? Um, so here's a statement about that. The greater the mass an object is, the force, more force it exerts when it falls. Okay? Now, this is, uh, this is a fact. All right? um, if something has more mass, it's going to fall to the floor or fall to the ground. It's going to hit the earth with more force um, when it falls. Okay, so why is that? Well, that's because any objects that have mass have a gravitational force pulling them together. So the ball and the earth pull on each other, and that's why the ball falls, and that's why it falls with more force, because they both have more mass, and more mass causes a stronger gravitational force between those two objects. Okay? So that's why the ball will fall with more force. Okay, now, here's the question. Both of these underlying statements that I made are indisputable scientific fact. One of these statements is a theory, one of these statements is a law. And I'm challenging you here, pause the video if you don't know and you want to try it yourself, which one of these statements is a theory and which one of these statements is a law. Pause the video and see if you can't find out for yourself. Okay, if not, I'm going to keep moving here. Okay, the statement on the left predicts patterns that we see in science or that we see in nature and natural phenomena. The one on the right explains why those patterns occur. Any guesses? Well, the statement on the left is a law, and the statement on, our, on the right is a theory. Both are indisputable facts. So can a theory be indisputable fact? Absolutely it can. The job of a theory is not to be somebody's guess or just somebody's idea, hypothetical, get it, hypothesis, idea. Theories explain natural phenomena using evidence. They piece together all these different forms of evidence and provide one large explanation for why things are the way they are in the natural world. So the definition of a theory in science is that it's a carefully thought out and well-supported explanation for observations of the natural world that has been constructed using the scientific method. Okay? These are two really big theories over here. Continental drift explains patterns of evidence in geology and paleontology, why we might find fossils um, of tropical plants in Antarctica, or we might find the same fossil of fish in South America as we do in Africa. All right? Same idea with biological evolution. This explains why we see things the way they are in biology. It's carefully thought out, and it's very, very, very well supported um, in science. Okay? So that's what a theory does. It does the explaining. Okay? Strong theories explain a lot and are well supported by scientific evidence. The more a theory can explain, the stronger it is. So some examples of strong theories are evolution, big bang, human caused climate change, plate tectonics, gravity, relativity, etc. Those are all theories, those are all explanations for why the natural world is the way it is, why we see these observations in the universe as the way they are. Okay? Those are all very strong theories, well supported, and they're really, really good explanations. Okay? Weak theories tend to explain very little and are not well supported or are used for personal advantage, i.e. the COVID 5G link is not well supported, flat earth is not well supported in evidence, phrenology and eugenics, which are promoted to, uh, per, or push to promote a personal agenda, um, a link between vaccines and autism, alchemy, and the heliocentric model, excuse me, the geocentric model, are all very weak theories that are not well supported through scientific evidence and observation. They don't explain much at all. Okay, so that's what makes them a weak theory. There's not evidence to back them up, and they don't explain very much. Okay? Theories become stronger the more they can explain, like I said, and theories become weaker the more they can't explain. But a neat thing about theories, as opposed to, say, dogmatic beliefs that do not change in the light of any evidence, is that theories can change in the light of new evidence. Some are so well supported that they're considered facts. Okay? Theories can change. Science is cool that way in that if there's new evidence that might suggest that we were wrong about something, theories can change and theories can be adjusted and to account for new evidence. Okay, so here's a defunct theory, the geocentric model, the idea that the Earth is at the center of the universe and that everything else revolves around Earth. This has been debunked. The evidence did not support this theory and new observations came to light that this theory could not explain. Thus, we favored the, the heliocentric model where the planets revolve around the sun and now the model of the universe is just like it's huge and there is no center to it and it's always expanding. So there you have it. 
Um, but yeah, theories can change. They're not dogma. Okay? And just to illustrate the fact that uh, theories can be absolute indisputable fact are uh, these three theories, germ theory, atomic theory, and combustion theory. All right, these all provide explanations for why we see things in science and not, or in the natural world, and they're super obvious now. Germ theory talks about, okay, there's these little tiny microorganisms that enter your body and make you sick. That's an indisputable fact, and you should probably wash your hands before, you know, you touch your face or anything like that because of those little tiny organisms. That's a theory. Atomic theory, the idea that all matter is made of atoms and the whole study of physics and chemistry are based off of, that's a theory too, because it explains. Same idea with combustion. Why does fire burn? Well, it uses oxygen from the air in order for it to burn. That's a theory as well. Okay? All indisputable, super obvious, no-duh type facts, but they're all theories as well. Okay? So one of the main goals of science is to formulate theories and explain why things are the way they are. This dude named Johannes Kepler developed three laws of planetary motion during his life when at, while um, accurately predicting the orbits of planets. He could figure out, oh, Mars is going to be here, Jupiter is going to be here, it's moving at this part, part of the sky, and it's going to be there on this particular date. Um, but he could never explain why they orbited that way. He never explained why, accurately, why the planets orbited the sun in the way they, they did, or why they appeared in the sky the way that they did. He could predict when they were, but he couldn't explain them. So what he developed are three laws of planetary motion. Laws describe and predict what will happen with a natural phenomenon using ooh, using a mathematical equation. I lost my little heading here. Um, so laws are not necessarily better than theories. They're not a proven theory. It just does a completely different job. Okay? Theories do the explaining. Laws do the predicting. So here's Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. You can use math to figure out where the planets are going to be and when in the sky. Uh, so here's a bunch of examples of laws. And they're often written using a mathematical equation. Okay, a lot of these you may have seen in a physical science or a chemistry or physics class before. Okay, but these are all laws, and these are, can be predicting um, the outcomes of a variety of situations and a variety of um, phenomena. These can be used to predict them in, uh, in the natural world. Okay, so here's that Venn diagram again, summing it all up. And uh, if I were to sum this video up in one sentence, it would be a law tells us what happens, a theory tells us why. Uh, they have two different functions in science, and a law is not stronger. We need to dispel this notion right now and get rid of that misconception that a law is just a proven theory or something like that. Um, both are used to make hypotheses and are supported by correct ones. So here it is. A theory explains why natural phenomena occur. Law summarizes a set of observations about natural phenomena that can be used to predict. They're both based on correct hypotheses. They can both be used to make predictions, and both can be revised. Okay, a law can be revised too in the light of no evidence. Okay, that's important to note as well. All right, that'll be it for this video. Please let me know if you have any questions. We'll see you next time.